All right. So one of the questions that I get all the time from a whole bunch of different people across all my platforms is what lens should I buy? I get this question a lot, especially from like newer photographers who are just getting into the game or like have been in the game for a little while and have been learning photography for a couple of years. And it's a fair question because there's just so many different lenses and so many different choices and configurations that you can really go for. And so this video is my recommendations for what you should get in kind of like an order of preference, I guess. But I'll explain a little bit more as we get into the video. For now, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Pat Kay. I'm a travel photographer based in Sydney, Australia, and I make videos on the creative process. Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about lenses in a, a little bit of a gamery fashion. So I've got a tier list here, and if you haven't used the tier list before, it's basically just a visual way to like rank things, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But I wanted to preface this video by saying that you know, all lenses can do all things and the opinions that I'm sharing in this video are my own opinions that I've, you know, formed over using these lenses over the last you know, years of, of me being a photographer. And so if you don't agree with the opinions that I'm giving about these lenses, you know, just know that they're just they're just opinions and you can do with them what you will. I'm not here to start a flame war. I'm not here to like, you know, promote negativity or anything like that. At the end of the day, the gear here is for you to use as tools and, and nothing more, right? So uh, yeah, I'm not trying to pass judgment on your decisions or anything like that. These are just my opinions. Okay, with that said, let's get into the tier list. Now, what we've got here is four lines and four rows from S to C. Obviously S is like the best of the best and C is like not the best of the best. Uh, it's kind of obvious, right? Down here in these like little circles, I've got focal ranges or like zoom lenses. And then down below, I've got like focal lengths or like the prime lenses, right? I'm gonna be talking about the ranges and lengths as like a whole rather than the like individual lenses themselves. That way it can translate to whatever system you're on and whatever like configuration of that lens you're trying to go for. So the first ones that we'll talk about are the zooms, specifically like the holy trinity of zoom lenses, the 16-35, the 24-70 and the 70-200. So for me, the 1635 is interesting because it is, if you know me and my work, I shoot probably the majority of my work on the 1635. I shoot probably like 60% of, of, my, of my work on this lens. And I always recommend it to everyone who's first starting out because it's just so, so versatile, especially the 35 end, which we'll, we'll get a little bit more into when we talk about the actual length itself. But the 1635 for me is a lens that I recommend everyone get. For that reason, I put that in the S tier category. It's also a lens that you can buy in a whole bunch of different configurations as well. Usually the F 2.8 versions across the board. So whether that's like, you know, Sony or Canon or Sigma or whatever, whatever manufacturer, they will make an F 2.8 version of this style of lens. And that is usually the better, higher quality, more professional version. It also has the price tag to match usually, but you can also get this in a F 4 version, which is usually lighter, usually smaller, usually cheaper, but a little bit less quality and you know, you don't get the, the depth of field or the low light capabilities that you get with the F 2.8 version. Keep that in mind, depending on what budget you have, the same ideas apply to any of these lenses. There's a whole bunch of different configurations for every single one of them. So the next lens is the 2470 millimeter. This is a lens that I have a love hate relationship with only because I have this philosophy, right? That the lenses that you own should constrict you enough to be able to force you to be creative with them, to experiment with them, to push your boundaries, right? The 2470 can do everything. And that to me is both a blessing and a curse because you aren't forced to move backwards, move forwards, change your position, change your you know, perspectives all the time. 
it feels to me lazy and it definitely felt this way when when I owned the 2470s back in you know a couple of years ago but I've I've since sold them right so I'm gonna put this in an A tier and I know that's gonna ruffle some feathers and I'm sorry if it ruffles your feathers but um for me, the 2470 isn't as useful, versatile, or as confidence creating as the 1635. And so I actually don't, I find myself not recommending this lens that often. Uh, only if you have a very specific use case in which, you know, you might only have the money to buy one singular lens. And okay, then maybe a 2470 makes sense. But um, for everything else, especially if you're progressing in your photography uh, craft, yeah, 2470, I just don't vibe with them. Okay, the next one is the 7200. Now this is a lens that I vibe with, right? The 7200 is great for landscapes and compression shots, wildlife, sport, a whole bunch of different things. It isn't, however, a lens that I recommend to everyone because it starts to get a little bit more niche, right? Everything under 70, like that's like the general photography area. Everything over 70, it, it kind of gets a little bit more specific. Like you have to know the style of shots, the category of shots that you want to shoot in order to know that you need this lens. So I never recommend this lens for beginners, but if you've been shooting for like a year or two and you're starting to get into the flow of like exploring different types of photography, then the 7200 and the 100, 400, which we'll soon talk about, are telephoto lenses that I highly recommend you get yourselves into as well. For that reason, you know, it's not for everyone, uh, but it is for many people. And so I'm gonna give that an A tier. Now the next one is something that is for me a little bit contentious, uh, or my opinions are a little bit contentious, I guess in that I always reach for the 100-400 more than the 7200. I actually sold my 7200 in favor of this 100-400 because I find it better. I find it more versatile. I find myself not needing the f2.8 or the f4, especially when you're shooting like long distances the depth of field starts to get to the point of diminishing returns. So just so that you know, the 7200 usually comes in an f2.8 or an f4. And again, the f4 version is like smaller, lighter, cheaper, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas the 100-400 usually comes in like a 4.5 to 5.6. So it's a variable aperture range. But with that, I find that 4.5 or 5.6 is more than enough, especially if you're shooting at 400 or 200 or whatever, for the types of shots that I do, in which, you know, if I'm shooting a landscape, right, especially really, really far away, there's a chance that I'm actually shooting at like, you know, F8 or F11, just so I can get the depth of field. And so having a 2.8 or, you know, F4 lens doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So. I would rather have the 200 to 400 tele extra versatility versus the 70 to the 100, you know, the less tele uh, versatility because the difference between 70 to 100 is not that much in my opinion, whereas the difference between 200 and 400 is more. And I'd rather that versatility over the speed and, you know, the lower end and all that kind of stuff. But it's still not a lens that I recommend everyone should buy. Again, this is a, a specialty lens, uh, but it is one that I recommend if you're looking into the telefocal ranges. I like the 100-400 more than the 7200. Okay, so the next lens is the 24-105, and this is a lens that is very similar to the 24-70. It kind of does everything. And it's really great for videographers because you have one lens that shoots all the focal lengths and that's great. For photography, for me personally, I don't really vibe with it because again, it doesn't really inspire creativity for me. It's usually, it comes in usually like an F4 version and you know, it's not as sharp as like the 2470 usually uh, just because the, the range is longer, but yeah, I, I, I don't recommend this this lens often, actually, um, except in like hardcore video cases, but that's kind of it. The next one 
is the 7300, and this is the first telephoto lens that I own. This is the kind of pathway that I actually recommend most people go if they are looking to get into the more telefocal ranges. Because the 7300 typically across the board, whether it's Sony, Canon, Sigma, whatever, is always cheaper, it's always variable, it's always smaller, and it's a really, really good way to start to train your eye into, you know, translating whatever you see in your vision onto the camera because it's very difficult to to train this skill of being able to see in telephoto and then being able to replicate that in camera and so with that like i recommend this quite often um, especially if you don't use tele a lot and so i'm going to put this in the a tier if you're looking to get into the telefocal range i recommend the the 7300 as like a first step Okay, and now we get into the focal lengths and the prime lenses. So the first one is the 10 millimeter. So with this, I owned the Voigtlander 10 millimeter probably like three, four years ago. And at the time, like it wasn't popular at all and it wasn't even that common and I loved it. It was one of my favorite lenses because of how unique looking it was, but that uniqueness comes at a price. And that price, aside from it being literal, like that was an expensive lens, the price is that it's very niche in its use case, right? You can only pretty much use it for architecture, pretty much. Like you're shooting indoors, you're shooting real estate, you're shooting, you know, uh, things where you don't have a lot of space, right? And so for that reason, I would recommend this lens to only the people who are shooting architecture a lot, and that's it. Usually it comes like in a much slower uh, aperture. The one I had was f 5.6. Not that it really matters at that length anyway, like you're never gonna get a shallow depth of field, but in any case, yeah, it's very niche, uh, but very interesting anyway, if you're looking to get into it. 14 is a common focal length that a lot of like astrophotographers get into, especially nowadays. Nowadays, there's more options than ever for like a 14 millimeter f2.8. And all of those come in like a manual setting, which you kind of need for Astro anyway. But this is another lens that gets into the realm of you know, niche lenses in which you have a specific type of photography that you shoot and you need a specific piece of gear to get the best out of that type of photography. For that reason, for me, again, it's going to be like a C you'll know if you need this lens, uh, but I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. The next one is the 20 mil. The 20 mil I've earned a couple in uh, my life. And it, it again is one of those ones that's hard to recommend because it's not really versatile for everyone. Again, you'll know if you need it. So I just got my hands on the newest 20 millimeter from Sony, the F1.8 version, which is really, really tiny. It's like, it's like half the size of this 85, right? Um, but back in the day, I also owned the gigantic Sigma 20 millimeter as well. And, and whilst that was, that was great, it was just way too big and way too heavy to justify that like, kind of niche focal length. For that reason, it's gonna be, uh, I mean, B's are, yeah, like it's all right. It, look, ideally it's between B and C. I'm gonna be generous and give it a B, just because it's starting to be a little bit more versatile, uh, but tread carefully with this one. Okay, the next one is 24 millimeters. This is one that you know, I've become really like fond of it over the last year and a half, maybe two years. This focal length can do so much and it comes in so many different awesome configurations. I'm actually shooting on the 2414 G Master right now and it is awesome for a whole bunch of different reasons, but I kind of like to use it in an unorthodox way, right? So when you typically think of 24, you think of like video, or you think of like, you know, cityscapes, you think of like almost walk around lens territory, almost not quite there yet, but it is quite versatile. But I love using it for portraits. And I shot a whole bunch of portraits with my friend Georgia last year with this lens. And I like, it's just so different. I love the way it comes out. It's just, it's, it's so unorthodox. And you know, for that reason, it, it's become a favorite of mine really. And 
I can't actually talk highly enough about it. And so, yeah, I'm gonna give that an A. All right, and now we're at the two most common focal lengths, the 35 millimeter and the 50 millimeter. So these two, uh, and uh, yeah, this, this is gonna be interesting for me. Um, okay, so 35 first and foremost. I love 35, it's my favorite focal length. It gets an S tier straight away. I can't recommend it highly enough and I recommend it every single time that someone asks me what lens should I buy. It's that good. 35 does everything, everything you want it to do. You can stitch together photos if you want to do architecture or you can stand really far back, whatever. You can take landscapes with it. You can take cityscapes with it. You can do street photography, portraits. You can do so much with this lens that I recommend every single person have a 35 in your bag, period. When it comes to 50 millimeters, which is the other focal length that most people recommend as well, this is the more like standard focal length that you know the human eye sees. And it's fantastic, don't get me wrong. I've owned a bunch of different 50 equivalents in the past and even now I have a 55 f1.8 from Sony that I love because it's tiny, it's super, super sharp. I can bring it around everywhere and it's awesome. But in terms of 50 versus 35, I would recommend the 35 every time, hands down. I just don't find the 50 to be as versatile as the 35. And for the reason that I'm about to cover in the next lens, you know, I feel that the 50 is just not as good as the 35. And for that reason, I'm gonna give it an A because it's still damn good, don't get me wrong. Like if you, if you love that focal length, then you should totally go for it. Uh, but it's for me not, yeah, it's not S tier, but it's damn good. Okay, the next one, the 85 millimeter. So if you know me and my work at all, you'll know that between the 85 millimeter and the 1635, I have these two lenses in my bag all the time, regardless of what I'm shooting, where I'm shooting it, whatever. Between these two lenses, they cover 90% of the things that I shoot. I love the 85 and I love using it in unorthodox ways, right? The 85, you usually think like portraits, like headshots, you know, like, you know, chest up type headshots and chest up portraits. But I love using it for street photography where everyone else kind of goes for like a more traditional 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, lots of, you know, depth of field type street shots. I love going the other way and using an 85 with just a little bit of, you know, compression, a little bit of telly at 1.4, which is what, this guy is, uh, just so that I can separate the subject a lot in street photography. And I find that for me, that produces really, really unique results that I've become addicted over the last, you know, three, four years that, that I've been using the 85. The next one is the 105. The 105 is in my opinion, like a little bit more of a, I guess like a budget version of the um, 85, like it's, it's good, it's just, I wouldn't recommend it over an 85, right? The, the difference between 85 and 105 in terms of focal length is not that much in real life. And then, you know, the 1.4 is a super either big or expensive or whatever. And then it's kind of like less versatile than the 85. And so I would definitely recommend the 85 over the 105 unless you, you really find the need to use 105. I think it's a specialty kind of length. Next one is 200 and up, I guess. These are, like, are kind of self-explanatory, right? Like they are prime lenses that come in like an F 2.8 or in a four configuration and they're huge, especially like, you know, the, the 400 millimeter F 2.8 from any brand. It's like a $10,000 lens that's bigger than the size of my legs. Like you really need to know what you're doing and chances are you've probably got all of these lenses if you're looking at one of these anyway, but typically they're for like wildlife, birds and, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, like you'll have to know what you're doing if you're gonna drop 10K on a gigantic lens, right? So for that reason, it gets a C. So yeah, that's it for this video and this tier list. Let me know in the comments below what you guys use and what you consider an S tier lens, because I'd love to know. 
That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it insightful. If you did, give it a thumbs up. I make new videos on the creative process every single week, so subscribe to see some more. But for now, be well, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.